Bobby journalism. Reagan. It's time for you guys to start being journalists. Oh, that was Andrew Baldwin. He was one of the attorneys who used to represent defendant Richard Allen. He's the man charged with the 2017 Delphi murders of Abigail Williams and Libby German. Now, last week, Baldwin and his co-counsel Brad Rosie were denied the opportunity to continue their representation of Allen. The controversial ruling stemming from the leaked crime scene images that were traced back to Baldwin's office and one of his former employees. Now, immediately after that, Allen made it clear to the court that he still wants Baldwin and Rosie to stay on his case. Despite that, the Honorable Fran Gall said in her ruling, quote, Mr. Allen, you are entitled to adequate representation in your case. You are entitled to a vigorous defense in your case. And this is difficult, Mr. Allen, because I know what you want. You've indicated that through your attorneys, but I cannot and will not allow these attorneys to represent you with the concerns that I've had, with the gross negligence that I found. They withdrew rather than be found grossly negligent and be removed. I can't do it, sir. I just can't. I cannot allow that." End quote. Now, some other lawyers are stepping in, filing a motion with the Indiana Supreme Court petitioning the state's highest court to reinstate that original defense team and adding a few other demands as well. Saying in part, quote, here the judge acted to terminate the attorney-client relationship when she had an absolute duty to refrain from doing so. This court should mandate attorneys Rosie and Baldwin be immediately reinstated. But reinstatement of Rick's counsel, they call Richard Allen Rick, um, of choice is not sufficient to remedy the violation here. Rick was pursuing a speedy trial and third party guilt strategy. He intended to file a speedy trial request in early November, but the judge kicked them out of the case. A new judge should also be appointed to avoid the appearance of bias that will otherwise permeate these proceedings. To get their thoughts on these new filings, let's bring back in our think tank. Still with us, Deputy Public Defender for L.A. County, Philip Dubé, criminal defense attorney Darnell Crossland, and family law attorney Jennifer Brandt. Darnell, I'm going to start with you on this one. Bold move from this other group of attorneys. Uh, filing this motion, they want several things. They want the judge off. They want the speedy trial to happen. They want the original attorneys reinstated. And they want to see that transcript. They took the time to reach out to the court reporter to get that in-chambers conversation between the judge and the attorneys right before that hearing date when we were all like, what is going on? The attorneys are withdrawing. What's happening? This was supposed to be a big day. Hey, lots of arguments were to be had, and nope, uh, but they can't get it. The judge won't turn it over, so they're going above her head. What do you think, Darnell? What's going to be the result here? Well, a couple of things happen. Um, obviously, if you want to stand up and fight for yourself, you can do so. Um, if you think that it's going to be a fair result. Um, in this particular case, those lawyers knew that this judge was going to find them grossly negligent, kick them out, the result was going to be the same, so they withdrew. No one wants to have that on their record if they can avoid it. Not to say that you could always avoid attacks, even in, in our field. Mm -hmm. um, they will come for you. Um, but in this particular case, the amicus um, lawyers, if you would, filing mm -hmm. on their behalf, now they may have a different audience with the Supreme Court, and now these guys uh, could support that move. And I'll, I'll just say lastly on that same subject, uh, when you have a speedy trial, you have to be brought to court within trial within 30 days. If not, then uh, typical practice books here in Connecticut, you have to file a motion to dismiss the indictment right after that. Um, so now if the judge is going to delay this with all this, these shenanigans here, then the speedy trial right is going to be violated 100%. And so that's why it's important to put that in there because you can't dial it back. If mm. they don't get, if he's not brought to trial in 30 days, he lost that right is gone. Mm, right. This is a mess. I called it a disaster in Delphi when I heard this news. Jennifer Brandt, want to get your take on this, please. Your thoughts tonight on this mess. It is a mess. Um, and I think that the defendant has a right to have, you know, it's it's known that a defendant has a right to have the lawyers that he wants. And he, he wants these two lawyers. So I, I do think perhaps the judge overstepped her bounds. She was 
obviously angry with the uh, release of those of those photos. Um, and, you know, we would love to hear what went on in chambers there and what she said to those lawyers, because as Darnell pointed out, as a result, uh, both of them decided to withdraw from the case, uh, probably to avoid uh, some kind of something on their record, some kind of finding by the court. Um, so she was angry. And, you know, we'll see. We'll see what the Supreme Court does with this one. Right, Jennifer. Yeah, they didn't want uh, that to be out publicly. Apparently, the, the backstory is, according to these attorneys, that the judge uh, essentially gave them no no choice. It, it was like, you withdraw yeah. or you withdraw. Or I'm going to publicly talk about how grossly <laughs> negligent you were, so I'll let you keep your That's dignity, right. do it quietly, and we'll appoint new counsel. Uh, Philip Dubé, last but certainly not least, your take, please. The judge was absolutely correct, 100 percent, and I'll explain why. There is a misnomer in this country uh, about the rights of defendants when they have court-appointed counsel. The distinction is when you are privately retaining a lawyer, even with almost no experience right out of law school, you are free to hire whoever you want of your choosing. But when you opt for court-appointed counsel because you are legally indigent, you take pot luck. They draw your name from a list of regional attorneys who have been pre-approved by the court system to work at reduced rates, either pursuant to a contract or a memorandum of understanding, and they get paid by the court, not by the client. So that, that is misnomer number one. Number two, uh, the judge absolutely is duty bound to keep all communications regarding that attorney-client uh, relationship confidential in closed session behind closed doors. They can do it in chambers with a reporter there and keep all the proceedings under seal. The reason why you do it that way is because oftentimes the communications involve having to give up work product, attorney-client uh, privilege communications, and obviously you don't want the prosecution, let alone the public, to be hip uh, to what you have done thus far on a case. So I realize that Mr. Allen was happy with his lawyers, but the judge has a duty. That duty is to make sure that justice is served and that his lawyers do not do anything that could prejudice his rights. And this judge found that uh, they crossed the line and the only alternative would be to uh, bring in another court-appointed lawyer to resume where he left off or where his team left off. Philip DeBay, I want to applaud you uh, for that. Uh, you're right, and you were the first person I've heard to make that distinction because thinking back, I think many of us, uh, you know, myself included here, didn't realize those first two attorneys were not privately retained. Correct. They were appointed attorneys, not, I think a lot of people think they're private counsels. And so right. to your point, if it is a private attorney, yes, hire whoever the heck you want. But if it's a government appointed attorney, um, if, if you don't like your attorney, that's not reason, you know, to be to be rid of them. And now follow up for you, Philip, it's like a law sure. school problem. Yeah, now, okay. Baldwin and Rosie, remember how they came in and, and at the last second said, we'll do it pro bono. We'll just rep him pro bono. No. And the judge was like, I'm not even listening to this argument because you two are off the case and I've already appointed two new attorneys. What about in this case? Does it change anything for you, Philip? Well, I guess the question now is, would they become uh, counsel of Mr. Allen's choosing as if they were privately retained because they are now uh, not working for a fee, mm -hmm. but that they're doing it pro bono, essentially free of charge, gratuitously. I still think the judge has the right to say no. Competent counsel has been appointed. We don't want further delays. And you need to be mindful of why you were removed. You did something that prejudiced the rights of your client. I don't want this to repeat itself. And if you feel you have an issue and he's convicted, great, maybe appellate counsel can raise it on appeal. Normally when you're denied the right to have counsel of your choosing and you're convicted, it's reviewed under what's called a structural error analysis. Mm -hmm. In other words, you're deprived your right to counsel of your choosing. I don't think that's the situation here. He had competent counsel, they got uh, removed from the case and now he has substitute counsel, they're doing a fine job. And absent some complaint or some alert to the court that the new counsel has engaged in some type the shenanigans that's prejudiced the defendant. The show must go on as is. I hear you. We'll see if you're right. Philip Dubay, uh, Dubay, I love the law school lesson there. That was fantastic.